Ready? Good. I'll now start this uh, presentation on improving social connectivity as part of the World Mental Health Day and Tea and Talk Initiative that's taking place today on the 10th of October. So what is Tea and Talk? This is really encouraging social connection and communication to raise money and change lives. And it's like a, a whole pack of stuff you can download from the Mental Health Foundation available here. Um, which you can use at your college, things like bunting, uh, uh, napkins, uh, little flyers you can give out. So there's a whole load of resources. We just search tea and talk online. You can download those things and get them out in your college too. A great thing to integrate in your coffee mornings and your social um, activities as part of your project. So what we're doing today, our kind of content of this presentation. So this is a one hour live webinar. Um, by me, the project manager at RAC, and I've also got here some of the learners at the college, but also a partner college over in Blackburn as well um, to share some of their experiences. And um, <clears throat> this will be videoed as a presentation, so you won't only watch this in the live, but also I'd like to share this with those people who come to our normal classes and also put onto one of our, we've got like a sc display screen in the college. And it'd be nice to show some of this video there, so just it's repeating and available. Um, if you've missed it, you can still catch up. So the content is um, an introduction um, about social connectivity. Why is it so important? Um, we'll also like to talk about how to improve our social connection using social media. Um, and Chris will talk about how Blackburn did a great example of how Facebook was integrated into some of their classes um, in a closed group setting. Um, some opportunities to ask questions if needed. Um, one of my project team is also here who also would like to share some information about what's going on in the city at the moment in terms of those who are working and um, in isolation and mental health in that context also needs to be given some mention. So moving into the social connectivity and its importance, connection is one of the five ways to well-being um, outlined by the NEF in their research paper. And this identified that social relationships are very critical to our well-being. Well-being is increased by life goals associated to family, friends, social and political life, and decreased by goals associated with career success and material gains. So you can imagine any, in terms of where could well-being be affected, um, anyone who is, for example, very career focused or very much around focusing on financial and material gain could find themselves that sufficient balance socially isolated quite easily because obviously work takes priority over other things. So they tend to drop things like relationships with family and friends and spend more time in the workplace focusing on the career. Obviously at times in life that does become more important. Sometimes with young people these days are going through various challenges around acquiring income to afford a mortgage or they've just had it, got into a relationship and looking to get married or they need to save up for some big item in over expenditure in their life. So that's something that can happen with life transition. So when income takes priority and so on, so can the, uh, can also affect our social circles too. In terms of the influence of connectivity and governments have an opportunity to shape policies in ways that encourage citizens to spend more time with family and friends and less time in the workplace. That doesn't obviously mean people don't work less than their complete hours, but it means that they start to think about promoting flexible working and reducing the burdens of commuting and considering that as time also spent at work or thinking about work. Strengthening also local involvement of their employees also enable them to spend more time at home or in their communities to build supportive and lasting relationships. This really can only in turn improve their workplace productivity this is seen to be a factor of improving well-being. So um, as a result of that, you're going to be a generally better employee. You're going to be well for longer and have all the other benefits of being positive around you. So ways of connecting, um, not just connecting not just about other people, let's think about other things too. Um, other ways of being in touch and connecting also and connecting with oneself and allowing yourself to feel, which sometimes we often don't have time to do. Giving yourself quiet time again with yourself and connecting with yourself and allowing that sort of space to arise. Connecting with nature and being outside there and connected with what's around you, animals and pets also are great things to connect with and, and find that kind of like idea of belonging and so on. <clears throat> barriers to connections, what are the barriers to connecting with others? Some of the other things, other than, for example, commitments around work and pressures there, um, sometimes connecting with the wrong kind of thing can also affect us. So if someone else is like an ongoing state of distress, that can lead us to feeling challenged and drained and sometimes too many contacts can make us feel we're not protect, properly connected to anyone. So I'm kind of thinking around those people who are like, for example, joining um, new workplaces or going to university for the first time or joining a new college, sometimes have so many friends that even having too many friends, there's no, there's no actual quality of connection to 
fewer people or less people. Similarly, those people who can who get challenged, you know, um, who have challenges and difficulties of their own, being around those people can sometimes also drain us too. So, for example, if someone is a carer involved in a caring role, um, they might have lost of contact with relationships supporting others, and um, that's a necessary role and function that we need to perform. In, in that in that um, situation so this can lead to a loss of contact with opportunities people and things that support you um, as uh, again all things in life balance is needed so what we should try to do is seek out positive connections to balance time spent with distressed uh, balance out this positive searching out these positive connections consciously and looking out for them and taking more control of our lives this gives us more control we end up in the driving suit seat and we can then be more committed to living well so in an activity I would do with uh, using the chat here, um, I would just ask a question. I would say, how would you know if we were connecting or just making contact? So those people who are out there who wish to participate <coughs> could respond to this question using the chat. So how would you know if you're connecting or just making contact? What is the difference between these two things? So if anyone wants to come comment in chat there, so I'm just going to help my colleague here using chat. So click on the more icon over there, one moment, please. <laughs> Just doing some tech support. Yeah, if you go to the uh, more, more, or oh, chat, chat right there. Chat. That's it. Pop up. And if you say, that's right, you can type in there. So you can, you can respond to the um, question I've asked there. Right. How do you know? How do you know? Hello, Julie. <laughs> Just type, type the answer. Um. Okay, so if anyone wants to um, respond to that in voice or in chat, happy to see a response. Um, so we've got Chris getting there. So getting meaningful feedback from the connection makes me feel valued. Is connecting. Uh, don't feel you are giving all the time. Feels like you're getting something out of it. Yeah, so that's going in two directions. That's great. Two examples there. One coming in from Anthony. So, Julie, if you'd like to comment too on how would you know if you're connecting with others or just making contact, what are, what are the differences? Go for it. Just hit enter. Yeah. Okay, so Anthony's written here that you'll be looking for an immediate response um, in terms of connecting. Yeah, looking forward to it in a different way to looking forward to a person caring for. So you're look, looking forward to it. Um, this is connecting. You're looking forward to meeting people and connecting with them. That's just a good example. Julie, feel free to add anything as well in, in the IEI if you'd like to do that. Okay, so that's an example of an activity um, on connection. I'm going to just extend this now to the next one. So... As being well connected is good for your mental well-being, is there anything you could be doing more of? So if there's anything you could be doing more of in terms of your connections with others. So I'm thinking about our networks. Um, social, social connections at work, friends, um, family, uh, extended family that are overseas, like through Skype and so on, um, friends from school, Friends from college, friends from work, in different places, friends from the past, which you may be selective about. <laughs> you may wish to have some friends you want to select or not others, depending <laughs> on your experience with them. And I'll just read out the main chat. So this is, is being well connected good for your well-being? Is there something you should be, can be doing more of in the area of connection? i just read out what they put in the last question now. So Yaya wrote uh, that connecting uh, is meaningful, getting to know people. Tina wrote, I know that caring can be, should be an equal relationship, but too often there's other layers which social connections don't have. Indeed, there's much more involved in that transaction of caring. Can you just go back to the question, mate? Yes. Oh, I just flip, flip, try to flip forward by some strange way. One moment, please. That's the one. This is the question. Um, so as being well connected is good for your mental well-being, is there anything you should be, could be doing more of in the area of connection with others? read out this is what it says here um, so I was just mentioning about Tina's comment about 
Um, other layers that pairing roles have. Um, Chris mentioned something that makes you feel warm or want of a better description. Anthony mentions relationships need some work put into them in order to get something worthwhile of it out of it. Uh, yeah, Chris is a good point. Planning ahead is really important. I was trying to set up a school reunion recently and I sort of slipped by because I got too busy and then it kind of happened and I wasn't there. Not such a reunion I was involved with. So um, planning ahead does require like a good month of looking at one's diary and no, I'm not doing any work <laughs> that night. Um, so yeah, looking ahead is very important. It's a good, good factor. Planning ahead. I'll take another couple of minutes for any more comments. Okay. Just a couple more comments in there, which I'll read out and I'll move on. So planning ahead, yeah, managing time and making time to ensure it doesn't get lost. This is important management of time to make it happen. And that meaningful things are part of your regular daily routine or schedule as the entity is typed in. Very good. So let's move now on to social connection in a bit more detail and a bit about what social connection is. And I'm going to give some examples about how social connection, social media is being used. Uh, Chris will uh, carry that part out from Blackburn. So what is social connection? The subjective experience of feeling close to and a sense of belongingness with others. That's our meaning of it. <clears throat> Here's some ex benefits of things that have been found for a research project by someone called Emma Sapala, who's a PhD, who wrote a research paper on social connectivity. Some of this research data is United States based, so I will mention that. So benefits of social connection, um, of high social connection. So if you do socially connect well, you have a bigger chance of longevity. This is a 50% increased chance of longevity for this particular research study by Emma Sepala. Stronger gene expression for immunity. Lower rates of anxiety and depression. Higher self-esteem and empathy. Better emotion regulation skills and management of emotions. And generally, a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. That is what the benefits of social connection are. Let's now look at the flip side of this, the dangers of low social connection. So we've got here, it's worse for health than smoking, high blood pressure or obesity. So it's actually seen as being more dangerous than that. So when we think about the number of campaigns out there around not smoking, around blood pressure, around managing of food and nutrition, is there anything out there on isolation and loneliness? We don't see so much out there in the media on that. And yet it's still worse, a worse danger than all of those. High inflammation at the cellular level, high susceptibility to anxiety and depression, slower recovery from disease. Suicide, unfortunately, is a big part of it because obviously with social isolation, you are not so visible. And when you're getting closer and closer to this danger, then it can become almost invisible to others around you. And suddenly this person is not coming to class anymore or college. And that's a real, real, a real f f scary area. Um, Increased antisocial behavior and violence when I mean, it flips over, so people who are more isolated also can flip over into this um, extreme behavior, a violent behavior, because they actually need social connection. That's what they're missing and lacking. Okay, so over to um, looking at uh, this aspect here, which is about the how to increase social connection, the ways about going to do it. So these are methods. So these benefits come from, you know, not only the external, but also an internal step, sense of connection too. So it kind of works with being connecting outward and also inwardly, this kind of the solution to this connection problem. So says, as long as you feel connected to others on the inside, you still get the benefit of being connected. So sometimes children run up to other children and play with them. They don't even know them. They still feel connected from, from within. So the sense of being connected internally to oneself is a big part of it. How can we develop and can, um, you know, increase our internal sense of connection? A big part of it comes from being accepting of oneself. Because often one of the barriers to going out and meeting people or new people could be we kind of think, how are they, gonna, you know, how are they going to perceive us? That's something that can hold us back. And sometimes giving oneself the chance of thinking, yeah, I might actually be liked by other people. is like a starting point. And then taking the step from there, even if it's a small step. 
just something to think about. Um, also giving, sharing, supporting and doing acts of service and kindness for others. So it shows that going actively, doing compassion and volunteering has great health benefits and it creates a sense of connection. So a great way to build social connections is to go out and volunteer in you know, something that you really would like to do and are you know, are keen and excited about. And then um, that allows us to meet the people with like-minded who have a similar interests and aspirations in mind. Taking care of oneself, stress is really linked to high, high self-focus and therefore a lower sense of connection. So if you're happy from within, you're also more likely to feel connected and reach out to others. Next thing is also asking for help. And this is a big area, you know, in, in Great Britain we, we struggle with, is that asking for help when help is needed. So reaching out to those around you, you don't need to be alone if you can be able to express that to those people who are in family and friends who may be very much interested to see you there and uh, be welcome, happy to hear about you being available to meet them up on those days and times. Um, and invite you along with something you weren't necessarily aware about. So, you know, you get, you get the feelers out there and you'll get something that will carry you forward into being connected to other people. Okay, now, um, talking about how we can improve social connectivity, a great way of doing it is using social media. And Blackburn College have done a great bit of work in how they've integrated some of their um, social media within a project. So I'm going to hand over to Chris now, who's going to take over from here and give us a little presentation on that. Okay. And then at the end, yeah, so over to you now, Chris. Point of order, man, I'll just, it's not Blackburn College, it's Blackburn Council. It might oh, sorry. <laughs> we'll make sure we'll sort right, that. In the next version, yeah. yes, let's just change there it. Okay, right, I'll, I'll I can, um, I need you to stop sharing for me to share, okay? Okay. Let's yeah. just change that slide now, Chris. <laughs> um, let me just see if I can share my screen. Okay, hopefully this, this does link, it, it's possibly slightly different and um, perhaps a different take on it, but there's definite links to what Manage was talking about and, and perhaps some of the work that we've been doing around our classrooms in Blackburn. So um, I'll bring this up and hopefully this will share screen for you now. Um, but I just wanted to do a bit really about sort of social media, both in and beyond the classroom. And I think there's definite links there with some of what Manage was just saying, as we'll see as we go through um, in terms of connecting um, both virtually and sort of physically. And also perhaps that thing of making a connection via um, something other than people, perhaps through images and things like that. Okay, so um, hopefully. Um, I, I wanted to present on this because obviously I think it, it's probably in the media virtually every day now, social media. Um, it's massively grown, become incredibly powerful. Um, Think about the, the really big things like Facebook, but also younger people now using things like Instagram, Snapchat, it's a huge part of society. And I think one of the things that we're really aware of is certainly for the younger generations, but also potentially for other generations, um, it has huge potential, both positively and negatively, um, to have impacts on, on both mental health and on stigma. So I just wanted, I haven't been as fancy as Manoj and put my little chat breaks in. I would just wonder whether you've got anything feeling positive or negative on some of the impacts of social media on, on people's mental health and perhaps also around stigma. Yeah. I think I can see from Manoj there, yeah, that, that was a definite concern for a lot of our learners um, about privacy with social media. Um, I think if you're experiencing some of the things that um, our learners tend to experience, um, they might be very, very sort of wary of kind of going on Facebook um, in an open capacity and, and sharing things. Positives or negatives for anyone else? Um, I think there's, there's two directions with that, Manoj. One will come on. Um, I certainly think closed groups on Facebook are, are a really useful tool. I think you're probably right, Katina. I don't think we necessarily do um, it's the, the sort of wrap around of that and making sure that people kind of recognize both the benefits and the pitfalls, but in a way that's um, responsible and not scaremongering that, that still gets across the people um, just I suppose I need to be careful um, 
but yeah, certainly, certainly closed groups manage is, is one way. If, if learners are on Facebook, um, our learners have found that quite a, a safe way to communicate and talk. So is there anything else coming on chat? Yeah, very much so. Um, very much so. It, it, it's very much sort of, you know, we don't see a huge amount in social media about um, what's positive about it. And yet, for, certainly for some of my learners, that I'll, I'll try and explain in a couple of the groups that we've had in a couple of the classes and the different subjects we've had, they've actually found it. Yeah. Around drawing on our own experiences. Just, I guess that means Katina from sort of my own experiences, good and bad, of social media. Yeah, it kind of takes us back to um, particularly Mycroft and, and the sort of folded arms brigade and things like that. Um, if our tutors aren't confident, then that's obviously going to be a huge limiting factor. Getting okay, learners involved. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And also, um, not only that they can come and go on social media, but actually one of the things we've really found for one of our groups is actually some of the learners, when they don't want to interact in the real world, actually it becomes like a little fallback that actually I can go on a closed group on Facebook and tell the guys I normally meet with, I'm not coming because I really don't feel so great. Um, and because it's in that closed group, they're not exposing themselves to people that perhaps wouldn't react to that in an understanding way. And what we've actually found happens is kind of we get responsive messages then say, no problem, hope you get back soon. If you want to meet up for a brew, if you want to have a chat, then that's absolutely fine. It's almost sort of really peer supporting each other through through social media. Okay, um, I'll move on a little bit. Um, and I think the, the other point I wanted to get across and why it's important is I, I don't know what the other parts of the country are perhaps like, although I've got a feeling that um, Blackburn can be um, challenged in some ways around people using it but we see a lot of people actually they're far more comfortable using something certainly like Facebook than if you sort of say to them I'd like you to go on the internet um, or I'd like you to use a website they find that um, they tend to sort of throw their arms up and, and say they don't feel um, yeah quite around avatars and things like that um, so it can be that actually for some learners this is a more comfortable way of interacting but not and I think also for mental health it, it, it feels like, I think I made the point just before um, we've actually seen learners who don't feel well enough um, to come out in the sort of in the world if you pardon the expression um, and, and don't actually want to leave the house but actually can feel interact in a closed group or something like that and feel that actually that's a way of them staying in touch rather than sort of losing that person um, which can happen if we're not careful okay So um, as the project's evolved in Blackburn with Darwin, um, I set up both um, Twitter and, and Facebook pages. Um, the Twitter one was actually the easier of the two to do um, because I just went and set that up myself. Um, and it's an easier channel in that sense to kind of manage. Um, the Facebook one took longer because, because of the sort of implications of people input in and, and people wanting to contribute and things like that. Um, it came, it did need to come through the council system, not least as well that I was conscious of that, you know, that page needs to remain live throughout the life of the project and that is growing it and things like that. So that, that's done on that basis there. Um, so we set up both and, and we, we put that on our publicity now. Um, so one way it's obviously useful for people is they might not necessarily want to come straight and have a chat or respond to a poster or an advert, but if they can go on to a Twitter or a Facebook page and perhaps get a bit of a feel for what people have been doing previously on the project. They can have a look at what's kind of going on and things like that. They can choose to follow um, on either format if they want, if they're more interested in things and want to find out more. Um, and obviously then when learners come into class, we just make them aware that we've got both of those sort of communication channels. They can just come and, and have a look at stuff and see things that have been posted by other learners or by things on the project. They want to interact. I get questions coming through from Facebook. 
I can respond to those questions as well. Um, and we can set up events and, and publicize things as well from a project perspective. Um, okay, so I suppose for us in Brightman, just to give you an idea of where we kind of started with this, I think one of the earliest things we were doing was, um, it was actually on this day last year, it was World Mental Health Day 2015, and I had a group of learners and we were actually on a digital photography um, group. And it, we do a week where we go out and perhaps visit somewhere a bit different. Um, and because it was um, Healthy Selfies and World Mental Health Day, um, it wasn't, as you can probably tell, actually a selfie. My arms aren't that long. But we thought it'd be nice to get a picture of us just out and enjoying things like that. Um, and that was probably one of the first things we did and we posted that up on Positive Minds and we got quite a response locally from public health and things, um, sort of seeing that we're out there and we're doing things and exploring stuff. Um, and learners also quite like the fact that they could kind of try and express themselves in a tweet and I think there might be something, they don't have to use their own Twitter handle, they, they can also come up with um, something that doesn't represent them, it doesn't actually have to be directly linked in public back to them or anything like that. But actually a lot of learners felt quite comfortable if they were writing on the Positive Minds Twitter handle rather than on their own, um, either because they didn't have one or they wouldn't express themselves, they're more open to expressing themselves on those. And I know that's something that I think Caroline found um, in Barnsley as well, that learners were quite keen to talk about what they thought about mental health, um, perhaps not on their own Facebook or Twitter handle, but talking on, on, on somebody else's and just being able to express themselves. Um, and some further examples then sort of started to, it started to become a more prominent part of, of classes. Um, so there, um, they, we found that they really enjoy, actually, they're proud of what they've done, they're proud of what they've done, um, achieved, um, and it's a nice way for them to be able to share it. And we, tr we make sure we only share it in a way they feel comfortable for. So you can see there, with the exception of one learner, there's, there's no learners in the actual pictures. Um, the learner in the bottom right side was really happy to share and be involved and show what she'd done on the course and things like that. But for a lot of other learners, it was more just about actually being able to show off what they'd done. And the, down in the bottom left, there's actually our most recent one. That was yesterday. We were involved, um, two of the closed Facebook groups have been involved in World Mental Health Day yesterday. Um, we've had some from the various different knitting groups um, and fabric classes and, and different crochet, crocheting things. Um, they decided to do what they call like a yarn bomb. So um, there was a fun run yesterday in one of the local parks for World Mental Health Day, and they decided to yarn bomb it. One of the bridges there got covered in all different squares of knitted materials and things like that. Um, and they were really keen for us just to put a bit of information about the courses up there and things. Um, they got to show that off. And actually the other closed Facebook group got involved as well because um, a couple of the digital photographers actually were the official photographers for the fun run came down and took shots of everybody um, and shared those as well. So there's obviously good ways of linking in that social media in a way that people feel comfortable with. Really important that they don't feel it's sort of forced on them. Um, but you, I think, it, again, I think somebody made the point, it might have been for Katina. Um, I'm quite digitally savvy, so when I've been going into groups, I just ask people, does anyone want to tweet something? Does anybody want to put something up on Facebook? Do we want to share something? Um, and learners are, are pretty key. Learners want to, and I, I think we perhaps hold ourselves back in in the sector by not making those avenues available or being uncomfortable or worried about how we're going to do it. Yeah, very quick look at the chat. Okay. Again. Okay. Okay. So just want to talk a little bit more detail about these closed Facebook groups because this is something that we've done over the last sort of six to eight months. It seems to have worked well. Um, we started, um, I'm just reading Katina's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it started really with discussion in classroom and actually we started, it, it, the whole thing started because I, I was trying to suggest to digital photographers that we used a different social media platform, which was Flickr a really good way of them being able to share their shots and, and again Flickr has the option for a closed group so you don't have all and sundry popping in to comment on photos you can control it really nicely through the settings and get the group set up um, they were kind of one or two did join Flickr and what they actually found they really liked with Flickr was if they were thinking of going somewhere to take photos 
they could use the mapping facility in Flickr to see what other people have taken for inspiration, which did work, but perhaps not in the way I'd intended. Um, but what they did find, certainly in those groups, was that they, they, they liked the fact that it might be a good way for them to keep in touch both during and after the course. Um, in class, we made sure we did talk about sort of positive and negative aspects. And I think that led to us kind of saying rather than most people did have Facebook um, login um, and, and some were using it, some weren't using it at all. They don't go, I don't want Facebook, I've got a login, but I don't. Um, we did find some of them would do if they could join a closed group. Um, something also to, just to be aware of. Um, so definitely that, but obviously making sure they're aware of the dangers and just pointing out some of the pitfalls and things like that. That is perhaps not a good idea just to be posting things, everything openly, but making informed decisions about what they do and don't want to post. And, and the implications of it. And also we were really clear from the outset that in no way was it part of the class that you had to join Facebook, Twitter or anything else. Um, and one of the really interesting things is we definitely had one learner who's very much folded on brigade and she refuses to do social media. Um, the really interesting thing with that is the group that she does the digital photography with um, now have designated somebody who texts her whatever's been put on Facebook. So she's kept in touch regardless the rest of the group use Facebook, she stays off it, and they've even got her sending their photo, her photos to them, and they post them for her. So although she's not actually directly involved, the group are actually keeping her in that sense connected. They are making sure that she's involved and kept in touch with things. Um, so the other group, the, the Fabric Crafting Group, um, they've called themselves Wonderful Wool. Um, they're, they're led by one of the learners. Um, they mostly use that to share patterns, ideas, but also to show each other work and things like that. And they got really on board with the yarn bomb by using the Facebook group, and that seemed to work really, really well. Um, that group don't appear to physically meet. Um, and as I'll explain in a second, I've kept my role in any of this sort of very much backseat because I didn't want to feel like I was sort of driving the groups or organising the groups. So, um, they seem happy just to share on social media, talk about patterns, talk about things that they want to do um, related to fabric crafting. But also they do kind of just look out for each other quite informally um, around mental health. And they do post just a bit more personal stuff on there um, and, and work on that basis. Um, the other group, the digital photography group, they call themselves Happy Snappers. Um, now they meet physically fortnightly. They do um, a photo shoot once a month and they also have a once a fortnight get together where they look at the photos and things like that. Um, but they also share their photos um, in the Facebook group um, as a closed group and they'll comment on each other's pictures, give each other ideas about what they do or don't like about them. They tend to be very, very positive. Um, there's a real feeling that, you know, we're not going to be sort of critical of other people's images, whatever they may be or however they've been shot. Um, but they certainly give lots of feedback and things like that. And there's been real evidence there that uh, one learner was, went through quite a rough patch, really didn't feel well. She was having real problems with her physical health, and that was impacting her mental health. Um, but she actually found it useful because she, rather than just disappearing, she could just say, look, I'm not going to be there for a few weeks. I'm really not feeling so great. Um, and that elicited a response straight away. You know, is there anything we can do? Um, we'll keep in touch and things like that which I think then does link back to what you were saying, Manaj, is sort of meaningful connection. Um, and as I say, they're now, they've, been, they've done a couple of events now. They were involved in um, a 1940s day over the summer um, where they were asked to go down and take some photos. Um, and they were also asked to come down yesterday and a couple of them came down and did some photography around the fun run, um, visual photographers. Um, and, and that gave them some inspiration as well to kind of think about different types of shooting. A lot of what they tend to do is landscapes and things like that. And they were quite interested in getting sort of active shots and, and trying to work out how they were going to have to change settings on the camera to accommodate that. Okay. And yeah, we, we said, obviously it's important to explain to learners that the potential issues and benefits. And I think it's really important to get kind of a balanced view on that. Um, when we did that, um, it was quite evident quite quickly. Most learners felt more comfortable just being in a closed group. Um, and there's an advantage to that, that I think a lot of people steer clear of social media because they're worried about sort of trolling and the things that they read in the media 
um, by being in a closed group. Um, in the closed groups, they can decide who they let in. Somebody will need to be an, an administrator and kind of lead the group. Um, they'll make decisions on who they do and don't have in. Um, and, th and that seems up to now to work. Um, actually, we, we did have one or two people invited to the digital photography group who didn't really want to talk about digital photography or mental health. Um, and, and actually the group met and discussed it and, and very politely wrote to them and just said, you know, we're more than happy to have you in this group of digital photography, what it's about, things like that. And they're trying to keep it sort of broadly on topic. Um, as I said before, I took the decision. Um, I, I suppose I could have gone along and gone, I'm going to set this Facebook page up for you. You can all join. It's a closed group. I didn't really feel that was the way forward because it's not for me to take the ownership of it. Um, and, and really, the learners actually took it on themselves to do it. I gave them sort of the, the idea, the potential. Um, I think also that there probably was in the back of my mind sort of, you know, I'd have to police it if I was in charge of it. I'd have to make sure it was staying on track. I'd have to sort of deal with anything. To um, and so I didn't sort of have any direct involvement in it. But it was quite nice because both groups actually invited me as a friend. And I do sit in both of those groups very much really just alongside um, Occasionally, I get asked if I can post some pictures, and I'm more than happy to do that and contribute. And occasionally, if there's events coming up, I do let them know about things that are going on, things like that. But, so it wasn't it was important not to be in a formal or district capacity. And I think that's one thing that you do have to think about if you're looking at the closed Facebook group. Is it's a great idea, but you're going to need somebody, at least one person, who's kind of happy to be the admin for that group to kind of take a little bit of ownership of it to move it forward. Okay, just to finish up then before I come back to Manage. Um, further benefits and future plans. Um, learners are fed back, I think I've already mentioned, that they, they really benefit that being able to choose to engage or to not engage. Um, whereas if you're kind of in a physical group, that can feel uncomfortable. In a social media group, there's nothing really to say that you have to respond to something immediately. There's obviously downsides to that as well, but I think a lot of the learners like the fact that they can choose to sort of dip in and out. Um, we are now in Blackburn looking at developing um, a course around using apps, social media and mental health um, to explore a bit more fully some of those things and kind of have a play with that and also some of the other apps that are out there, um, making sure that as long as they're sort of evidence-based and we know that they're, they're, they're appropriate and useful and we're looking at that at the moment. The other thing that I'm kind of really interested in is, is looking at whether um, we can start to look at maybe some doing some live streaming from classes when learners don't feel they can make it. So if we get learners who hit um, a bad period, don't feel they can get to class, I think there's some real potential for actually being able to set up a camera and live stream it so that the learner feels they can participate without actually having to be in the classroom. I'm keep really keen to explore that some more. Okay, we're very quick for the chat. Great, Chris. That was okay. great. Can we just stop sharing? And then I can pass back to you, Marsh. What's on my screen? Is it me? Are you, you're on there now. Yeah, great. I'm going to bring up this. Some, the chat's had a lot of good stuff going on here while you were talking, Chris. Lots of ideas are coming up while you're saying. So do have a good look through that. I was just saying about live streaming. It's something we should think about doing and try and get some kind of a pilot. Just like a class. Maybe we can do it in maybe maybe spring, something like, well, maybe even sooner, but just planning one session we could do live, we've tested it out on our site. I was thinking about how promoting is so important to do it in advance. So I would set it up like a normal event at the college and just have a link to go to the live stream in there so it comes up in our usual events information, but I give myself at least a month or six weeks runtime. People then can register to it and then I can see how it's going. Um, <clears throat> and also nearer the time it promotes it a little faster. So something to think about. Um, comment from Anthony about uh, pets in terms of connectivity, um, steady companions about dogs. Yeah, I'm a big fan of dogs. Well, I have them myself, but mm. big fan and some stuff earlier about games. Hopefully the chat's being recorded. Yeah, yeah, we can make the chat available. So thanks, Chris. That was really, really enlightening about the social media use in a, in a, in a college council context, sorry, in a council context and how you made it work. That's something a lot of us partner colleges can take away and try and do something, particularly in our photography group. I mean, maybe your scheme of work for photography 
you've got a course called Focus, I think, isn't it? Focus Photography. Maybe in your scheme work, you can maybe suggest, or if it's not already in there, that this is something people can, can explore um, as a kind of dimension of keeping in touch between classes, sharing pictures. So they've got the option to do so. That way we can standardise those ideas. I think it works much better, really. When I say to someone, you know what, you should be using social media in your class, they say to me, well, how then? How am I going to do that? And then, like, I'm stuck with, oh, yeah, sorry, I don't really know anything about your subject, so forget about that. <laughs> but if it's, say, photography, you've got great context going out on a shoot. Photo yeah. Photography is awesome for it because there's something in sharing photographs and, and there's ready-made communities for it. Um, and even, you know, I, I don't see any problem if you get your, get your digital photography lot um, looking at things like Flickr, even if they don't feel confident to post them themselves initially, get, get them a feel for the community and the community is not a negative community compared to somewhere like Facebook or even Twitter. Mm. Um, people tend to be very complimentary about photographs or they, or they don't say anything. And if they don't say anything, you don't see it. Um, it doesn't seem to be the same sort of situation that you've got things being said. Um, yeah. Oh yes, something there about guidelines about how we introduce groups that Katina was mentioning is that you don't want to put them in an environment where they can get taken apart. Like if you post into, say, photography professionals, UK, London, and you're going to get pulled apart on your pictures. Maybe you go to some kind of a nice, friendly, friendly group, you're going to get the support. Similar thing is with your own uh, peers, learners, is that they get some ground rules and guidelines. If you are going to use this closed group, here are the ground rules. You need to be positive and constructive in your comments. I'm not a big fan of constructive criticism anyway. I think just being positive is what's really needed. And so any kind of creativity people are doing, they feel, they feel so personally about it, especially if they're starting out learning a new subject, you want to ignite the passion. Great, good stuff. So now, you know this little topic, we've got a little bit of time to go. And um, what I was going to do is just, Anthony here, one of our project volunteers, has got a lot of experience working in the city and found today in the newspaper. What small paper was it, Anthony? This is City AM. City AM. So I'm going to put you onto the microphone shortly. And just give us a bit of an article we found in City AM, which says, let's talk about mental health and stigma in the city. So a big place for social isolation is the city of London, I think. And uh, many examples of upsetting stories of workers taking their lives for working in the city because they haven't gone on to talk to. They often come from abroad. Like imagine they come from overseas. They don't make any friends. They're isolated. They're working extremely hard. They don't connect. So there's a great initiative Mind is set up called This Is Me um, in the city, and it's a pioneering citywide mental health project to aim to reduce stigma for city professionals. And so if you could read a bit out of this article out, that would be great. Um, we can get a scan of this, I think, or just make it where it is. Maybe Anthony can read this out, uh, a section of it. I'll just mark it down over there. That would be great. Okay. okay. Over to you. Right. So, this works. so if you're speaking to this zone here, that would be fine. Just speak, okay. turn it down and you'll pick it up. I'll just speak so yeah, yeah, go for yeah. broadcasting. Um, <laughs> one of the key things about this to note is that according to a recent survey, um, 62% uh, of employees um, have experienced poor mental health uh, where work was a contributory factor. So that 62%, in other words, a majority of employees, which is quite staggering. Um, and uh, I think this doesn't simply apply um, to the city, at least I'd be very surprised. I think it's probably um, generally uh, that you've got a majority of people with mental health problems. Um, now, I know from my own experience that um, what compounds this is that very often, um, certainly in the past, uh, an employee's poor mental health simply hasn't been recognized or diagnosed. So I suspect a lot of this is going undiagnosed, um, which in a, in a sense makes it worse, because if it's not diagnosed, then nothing immediately is going to be done to remedy it. Um, but I think that's actually quite a startling uh, statistic. Um, and I think it's something that, uh, you know, we should all be alerted to and recognize. Um, uh, work is such an important part of most people's lives that if things are going badly at work, then they're going to have a knock-on effect, obviously, in the rest of people's lives. Um, uh, so it's vital, I think, that, that this issue is addressed. 
um, and because it does have ramifications for you know people's work-life balance and so forth. Um, anyway, so that's so that's an article that was in today's edition of City AM, very appropriately. Um, I've had a look through one of some of the other papers, well, free newspapers. Um, haven't spotted anything else, but at least um, one of them has picked up from this. Can you paraphrase with us about this section here about yes, this? Yes, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I mean, this project, the This Is Me, says here, um, staff who might be struggling should be able to talk about their problems and know that if they do, they'll get understanding and support yeah. rather than stigma. Mm. This Is Me is one such initiative. Um, so far, 75 organisations have registered an interest, including many city institutions, Bank of England, Transport for London, Herbert Smith Freehills. Over 20 organisations are now actively participating. So this is a good kind of initiative. It says approximately could reach 420,000 employees. And uh, as a business, prioritising workplace well-being is not only the right thing to do as a responsible employer, but also makes business sense. Staff working for firms that practically support the well-being are more likely to be productive, engaged, loyal, and deliver the best outcomes for your business. They're less likely to take time off sick due to stress and poor mental health. So that's the last message we're going to give out to anyone watching this video <laughs> in the employer side. Um, thank you, Anthony, for giving that bit of nice bit of stuff. This is in the paper, City AM, was today. So Mental Health Day is appearing in many places. So thanks, everyone. I'll come back in again now. I'm going to here um, for the end of our webinar now. And just opening up for any kind of final questions. But in the meantime, I appreciate the participation of Anthony here, Chris, Julie, Yaya, Katina, and someone else who's joined us somewhere with a picture there on the screen. I'm not sure who that is. Katina there, I think that is. And uh, Chris, sorry for the Blackburn. It's Blackburn Council Positive Minds. It's a Chris's project. A great one it is too. Okay, good. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that's all for yeah. me. Any other final comments to close up? That's good. Uh, that was really interesting, Anthony. Uh, I imagine that's a very um, non-mental friend, health friendly um, environment of the city. I imagine it's very much about who can do the longest hours, who can pull in the biggest deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very alpha male sort of style organisations. Um, really interesting to see. I, I wonder whether um, locally we, we have um, something called the Wellbeing Charter, which employers are being encouraged to sign up to. Kind of like a charter of points for people to be able to actually work towards to try and improve that. I wonder how much sort of impact that has had, if any, in the city, or or what what they what they do or don't do with, with something like that. It'd be really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. So yeah, wellbeing charter something we all look at. So I mean, that sounds familiar. I think it's in our local council too. I'm kind of aware of that actually. So something we could look look into finding out about that. And promoting it was great. Yes, thanks, Katina. It was enjoyable. Thanks for your feedback and comments as well. Hopefully, the chat's going to be saved in and will be added to the, the file. Um, we've enjoyed it, and doing these things is always useful. We learn a lot of stuff from other colleges and each other. Yeah, so, hanging out from RACC tonight. Good night. Good night. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good. 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 Good